everyone. I'm Rick Benson. You are today is Tuesday, December 15th, and welcome to this week's In the Note Trader show on StockCharts.com. This week, we're going to do a variety of things. We're going to start with, in our trader education portion, I want to take a look at some basic beginning chart analysis. In other words, what do you do when you start your analysis? You, you, you pull up a blank chart of, let's say, a bar chart of a particular stock. Now, where do you go? What do you do? So we'll talk about some of the basic things you should be doing to get a sense of what's going on. In our market overview this week, we'll take a look at the Russell 2000, uh, the VIX, and something that I really don't look at very much at all, but just because it's, it's pressing near all-time highs, we'll take a look at Bitcoin. And then this week, uh, we'll look at the consumer staples sector. We haven't looked at it since, I think it was the first week in September. So, so that's what we're going to do this week. Uh, as always, best way to get me is to email me at rick at com. And of course, we have two reports that we put out through In the No Trader. One is our weekly tactical trader report, which comes out Wednesday nights. It reviews in depth uh, across the uh, markets to typically will look at at least uh, three or four of the following. We'll look at the bond market, the dollar, the precious metals markets, and always, of course, look at the S&P um, with, with key levels to look at and play off of. Um, and then, of course, each week we give you a new recommendation for an ETF to play. It can be long side, it can be on the short side, usually long, but sometimes we go short or we'll find an inverse ETF if it's available, if we think something's going to come off. Um, and that's the, that's the Wednesday tactical trade report. And then, of course, once a month, usually uh, coming out on the last day of the month, um, we have our 7-Eleven report. We are outperforming the S&P by just beneath 2% already in just four months that we started. Um, and for those of you who are looking to get better results than the um, spider returns each year, um, then you might be interested in the 7-Eleven report. So that comes out monthly. All righty. Let's, um, let's start off with this um, idea of what to do with a chart. So what I want to do is, we'll get to this later. Let's take a look at, I pulled up, um, let's see, where is it? I pulled up a bar chart of Exxon. And here's a, a weekly chart. And the reason I just picked Exxon is it got an upgrade today from one of the firms on the street. They actually downgraded Chevron uh, against it. And you are seeing today that Chevron is off and Exxon is up. But this is a weekly chart. You can't quite see that. But let's say we start here. So we want a good medium to longer term view. We're going to start with a, a weekly chart. So this is what you're presented with, let's say, by your stock charts. Um, software package of, of a, a bar chart. What do you do next? How do you get a sense of what's going on? So here's a few things that I'm gonna show you. I would always look at uh, to get a sense of what's going on on a, on a particular name. And um, I'll usually, if somebody's got an idea for me, I'll usually start at the weekly time frame because it gives me a broad view of what's going on. I think if you look at a daily chart too often, you get stuck in what's going on in the last few weeks or month or two, but it doesn't necessarily give you the good picture and you kind of want to know, am I buying something going counter trend? Am I buying something with the trend, et cetera? And I think the best way to do that is to take a look at a couple of years or, or more of what's going on. So here we happen to have, I don't know, almost eight years. I don't need to necessarily look at eight years of price activity. But what I see for sure is a couple of things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start drawing trend lines to get a basic sense of what's going on. So the trend line from the all-time high was broken through a few times. So at the very least, we can say here's the major downtrend line. And certainly just beneath it, there's something. Uh, more recently, there's a steeper downtrend line and we can even take this to this and say okay well that's very steeped and negatively sloped and at least um, Exxon's at least broken out of that I can even go from more recently and take the mid-year high anyway I'm going to look at that I'll say okay at least shorter term 
we've broken out of the downtrend line. So I want to put up a couple of trend lines to see which way they're going. And for the most part, other than the fact that I can now draw a slight uptrend line from this year's two major lows, I've got mostly downtrend lines. What else can I look at? Well, I see a major low here in 2015, which was pretty darn close to the low in late 18. So somewhere kind of around here gives us a sense of where support was that in fact got tested multiple times in late 2000, the second half of 2019 and broke. So this is an important area just north of 65, let's call it 66-ish, which we know in the big picture has, um, should create some upside limitation. And also the other thing that stands out to me just in a general sense of using basic trend lines is I often like to show myself where are any major unfilled gaps. And right now in this section, and often I'll, I'll use different colored lines so that, um, no, that's not what I wanted to do, here we go. Um, I can kind of just differentiate for myself what's going on and you know what lines are what. But as long as I get a basic sense of clearly this has been a downward trending stock for years, um, and really broke down in early 2020 um, and, and is trying to recover some of that decline. And that's what I'll start with, at least in this time frame. So I know if I'm buying, I'm buying, but I probably have limited upside before it's going to be more challenging to hold the long. In the big sense here, if I paid 42 and a half, should I have some upside towards uh, into the mid 50s or low 50s over the next several months? Yes, in the big picture, yes. Should I have some upside because we peaked up here at 56 and we double bottom? So there's certainly a chance we could continue creating the W pattern. So that also says to me we could get into the low to mid 50s. All right, so that gives me some sense of what I'm facing if I buy the stock. If I buy it now, do I have any sense of that this stock should make new all-time highs? And I'd say no. There's uh, the all-time highs are in 2014. Uh, it has tremendous dis distribution over years. Is there any sense of why I should think this should make new all-time highs? Absolutely not. By the way, by just adding a few more years back, I see there's also some type of triple bottom going back to 06, 08, and 10 that we got somewhat close to on the bounce this year. So now I have some context of, let's put, uh, I don't know, we can use an ellipse, but let's just say anything, you know, in and around something like that going from, oops. So anywhere from the gap down into this area, let's say for the next half year, I could anticipate some pretty darn good resistance. Um, and in a bigger picture, anywhere from, let's say, year 56, 57, somewhere around there, up to 66, this zone in between these two levels should be very, very major long-term resistance. All right, so now at least I have a sense of what I'm facing if I want to buy Exxon as uh, whatever firm on the street today upgraded it to a buy was. Then, that's, that's just trend lines, but look at how much information I have by giving myself a big longer term picture of what's going on. Secondly, what can we add study wise? Well, by default, here's a 200 week moving average. It's way, way above. Of course, it's downward sloped and has been for five years, but it gives me a sense too of average price over time, still well above where we're trading now certainly gives me upside, but I'm smart enough to know that this is gonna keep falling over time. Regardless of how much we, we trend higher, this is going to come off for months to come. Um, I certainly almost always will look at a MACD chart and I wanna get a sense, you know, MACD is, is a, I, I like it because it's both an oscillator and a sense of momentum. Uh, so it gives me two kind of feelings for the market all in one indicator. And what I'm seeing now is that not only did we have a very deeply oversold positive cross, but then we had a secondary cross 
and it's building momentum to the upside because the blue line, the 12 week exponential moving average is pulling away faster and moving higher than the 26 week is. So it's also got some upside momentum. So that's, that's a good thing. You know, I can put that into the general bullish category of why I could potentially buy the stock. What else will I look at? I'm gonna look at the cloud, which of course the formal name for this is Ichimoku. I'm gonna look more closely in to see what's going on. And let me get rid of the rectangle now, just so I can see also going forward, usually the, the boundaries of the cloud are the most important levels. So I know that this could rally over the next few months, but as I go into 2021, the bottom of the cloud moves lower. So if I go sideways, I may go nowhere in price for several months. I'm gonna bump into this and it might very well act as resistance. If I can get through it and start building a base into it, I might end up going towards the upside, you know, the top side of the cloud. And notice that the top side of the cloud for the first quarter or so of 2021 also, just by chance, unrelated, matches the downtrend line for the middle of 2018. So I know that somewhere in here, I might very well face resistance. And that's not far from where 2020's early peak or mid-year mid peak was. So again, uh, another case that could, certainly I can make money from 42 to something in the low 50s, um, but it gives me a sense of what I'm gonna have to deal with um, both price-wise and the psychology of, let's say, knowing that I'm long going into a weekly cloud and you know how I'll have to deal with that at the time. But the cloud to me is very important to look at. And then of course, you could use a basic oscillator. Let's, you know, we could put an RSI up here um, for weekly charts. Let me see what my RSI, oops, that's not what I wanted. Let me see what my RSI is set to. Generally weekly RSI is I do 13, daily is I do 11. So let's put this to a 13, apply it. And here's my RSI chart, which just now is kind of topping at a similar height from 2019. So I know that there's potentially, let's uh, put a little trend line here. And I know that, you know, I'm up against a recent, not recent, but a prior high. I also could, if I want, draw a trend line on this, like this, um, and then you, you essentially have a triangle. So before I put on any of my, let's call it fancier stuff that many of you tune into, uh, me for each week because of the DeMarc models that I'll use. Look at what you can do yourselves just by using some basic indicators that you would find in any textbook. Moving average, and that's, you know, all we put up here was, was the 200 a week. We certainly can put up a 50 week just to get a sense of which one, where they are in relation to each other. Clearly the 50 week, given this pattern is gonna be lower than where the 200 week is. Uh, because of all this consolidation, it's going, it's going to be much closer, you know, down in this area. Um, trend lines, we drew lots of them, but they really, and again, you can color code them, you can make them hyphenated, however you want to kind of be able to see what makes, you know, what are they different, what makes them different. But I know just from looking at this, this was the downtrend line from the major high. This zone between here and here uh, goes back in time. It's important lows that got broken. Um, here's the, you know, the downtrend, the, the current kind of bigger downtrend line. Uh, here's the, in, in the pink is the gap. Um, so notice how much information we get from this. And again, adding MACD, RSI, et cetera. There is a ton of work that you can do preliminarily in, in and this is just the weekly time frame. I can certainly do similar type work in the, in the daily time frame. And if I just switch this to a daily chart, we're gonna have lots of lines, things, on here, um, but there's some differences. Um, one of the differences is that both price on the near term basis and the lagging line in the cloud, which is price pushed back 26 bars, are both above the cloud. So that's near term bullish. It happened here quickly uh, in June. They both got, you know, it spiked above and then came right back off. Here, um, we're at least climbing up the conversion line. That's this magenta colored line. So near term, there's some strength. 
Um, and, and I should start getting a sense too that on pullbacks, the cloud now gives me a sense of where support underneath the market. So that if the overall market did decline um, and it pulled, let's say Exxon with it, where might on a pullback, I'd be more interested uh, in buying it than maybe necessarily buying it today on, on today's upgrade. And I think that's a really important fact to think about as you invest is um, all these upgrades and downgrades come and, and stocks move you know, quickly off of these, but does, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right time for you to be investing just because some analysts upgrades. Remember, you know, analysts have their own roles and their own reasons they do what they do and when they do it. And generally, it does not align with an individual investor's goals. Um, as, as someone myself who used to work on the sell side, I totally get and understand the role that the analyst plays and um, the pressure they have often in making the decisions they do and when they do. Um, so again, just because Exxon gets an upgrade today doesn't mean that it's necessarily a good time to buy. Um, so now I also, you know, using a daily chart, I get a short term idea of what's going on. I look at MACD on the short term, obviously it's a very different picture and it's starting to run out of steam. So some of this upside momentum is fading now and we're not far from potentially getting a negative cross. Um, so that's something to consider. Same thing, do I wanna buy it here? Maybe I, let's say I do want Exxon over time. Um, maybe you buy 20% of what you're ultimately gonna buy size wise. In other words, 20% of position today. Um, or 33% or whatever, you know, a fraction, and you wait for a down move uh, to come to buy more. Just, you know, an alternative. I'm not making a recommendation on Exxon. I'm simply using this as, you know, a example of how one should start looking at ideas when they think of buying or selling something. And, and I think, again, before I start putting on some of the tools I typically use, and in fact, I'm not even gonna put them on. I'm just gonna show you, you can do all these through stock charts. Um, these are all basic technical indicators that uh, combined can give you a good flavor of what's going on. And um, that if you look in multiple time frames, you're gonna get a much better sense of what to do than looking simply on the, you know, a daily chart or solely a weekly chart. So I like if, let's say, on a weekly chart, I have a positive MACD and they're spreading apart from each other, which they're not doing now. But if I have that in the weekly and I have it on the daily, then I have both time frames saying to me there's good positive momentum. You know, you may not get a large pullback. You may need to be a little more aggressive and pay closer to current price. So I'd like to look at the relationship of where we are in the cloud. Short term, we're above the cloud. We go back to the weekly chart, we're beneath the cloud. If I go to a monthly chart, we're way beneath the cloud, right? So, you know, you also get a sense in different time frames of the more things that can corroborate each other, the better. Here, I know my weekly cloud's above me and I'm going to run into resistance from it. Daily chart is telling me that we're potentially, you know, we've made our way through. It doesn't mean the cloud has to hold on a pullback. But if this double bottom is a good double bottom, then and, and we don't go back down to these levels, then if we get a chance, let's say, to buy a pullback to the baseline rather than the more aggressive conversion line, that's something that I might very well do and build into a position rather than just say, oh, some guy today or some woman today upgraded Exxon, I guess it means it's time to buy. No, it doesn't mean that at all. And also think about just how often analysts get the game wrong too. You know, them upgrading, it just means they think that it's going to outperform the sector that it's in. It doesn't mean that, look, this stock could go down. Let's say oil fell from the, the current $47 range to $20 a barrel. Well, I can virtually assure you Exxon's going to get crushed. Their upgrade simply means that they think this stock will do better than its peers in the group within the energy sector. Not that Exxon's just going straight up from here. That's why I'm saying they're, what they do as analysts is not in line with what you do as an investor. You buy something because you want it to go up and you hope it doesn't go down against you at all. 
that's not what analysts do. Analysts simply are making relative calls of names in their sector versus other names in that sector. Understand that. It's, it's really important that you understand that. So that's, that's what, and when I've used a lot of time today to do this, and, and my guess is I'll push off the consumer staples till the next time we have a broadcast because I know where we've only got about eight minutes left and I want to give you, you know, kind of quick market overview. But for those of you who um, are either somewhat new to charting or even somebody who's been doing it for 20 years, um, you should have your basic set of tools that every time you pull up a fresh chart, you, you should have certain things defaulted, like to me, I always have MACD on. I don't always have RSI on, but I always have MACD on. I always start with a cloud. Um, and then I add, you know, the trend lines to, and to see where are gaps and, you know, so essentially horizontal lines plus trend lines. Um, and um, I may or may not throw up the moving average. Often my head can kind of see what it would be. I don't always need to visually see it. Um, but, you know, to get a sense of trend. And uh, the more things line up in multiple time frames, the better the chance that um, your analysis uh, will lead you to more profits over time. And, and that's this week's um, trader education portion. And I surprised myself on how much time I just spent on that. But that's what we did. So let's take a look at um, what's going on in the market so we will go back to our powerpoint we'll go ahead to our weekly um relative performance of the 11 spider sectors to the s p uh week over week so the one here on the left this was uh at last week's show year to date and now we updated it through last night's close and what i do is highlight those sectors that have moved more than 1% versus the S&P in the last week to get a sense of you know, what's moving. And this week, there's only three of 11 sectors that have moved more than 1% relative to what the S&P moved in, in the same uh, prior week of trading. So not a heck of a lot went on rotation-wise. Materials came off more than 1%, um, but not much more. Energy was the uh, only gainer on the week. It had been down 46.8% last week. It's now down 45.4%. Uh, so it picks up, let's say, 1.4%, but still clearly the worst performer of the year. And then one of the worst performers of the year, real estate, had been down 18.7%. It's down 19.8%. Uh, so that picks up like a, another 1.1% or so of underperformance. And uh, so not much has gone on rotation-wise, which is interesting um, as we start heading into the end of the year and holiday kind of type trading. So in the last week, we're already seeing things slow down a bit. And that, that's also in alignment with the fact that the S&P didn't do much last week either. So not only did price not move much, but we didn't see much rotation either. Um, so that's what, that's what I take from that. Let's get to charts. Uh, we'll start off with the Russell 2000. I don't have um, I don't have access to the cash index that I can run the models that I want. So let's look at the Russell 2000 uh, by using the IWM. Um, and uh, that's Walmart. So I picked the wrong one. Where are we? Do, 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 do. IWM. Here we go. Okay. So here's a few things I want to spot. Um, for you that I see. So this is a weekly chart. Here's that 2009 low in the bull market ever since. I told you recently that the S&P had gotten very close to, in fact, it's achieved it and virtually trading on its fifth wave up um, using DeMarc's way of measuring uh, um, Elliott wave. And it's different and it, it, it breaks several rules of classic Elliott wave analysis. So um, I'm not saying that your fifth wave is going to align and be the same thing. But this is a model that looking back to the low in 2009 and saying that's the beginning. Um, hold on. Wait, let me look. No, this actually has the low. All right. So this starts a, a wave in 2016 saying the bottom was here. I thought I had set it all the way back. Nonetheless, um, it projected off of the 2016 low that we would get to 
and that would be the peak of wave five. And in fact, it, the, the week that hit it was the high high for that week. And then of course the, the sell off in late 18. Since the low now this year in March, this has been moving fairly straight up. Um, and, and let's blow this up now so you can see that this week is a sequential 13, what I call a plus 13, meaning that it's looking for upside exhaustion. And it's now suggesting that the uh, Russell through the IWM is at a point where you be, it's much more difficult to first put on new longs because this model is suggesting exhaustion of trend. Let's look at some of the prior signals. Um, 2011 on the peak, 2013 only for uh, maybe two months sell off. Here for six months um, before it really moved materially higher. Here in 2016 called the peak right before the big decline here sideways also for months. This one was early. Uh, this one was early. And now here we are again. So I, I can't tell you that um, it, it, what, what this says to me in the small cap world, it's much harder uh, to first be putting on new longs here because it's, it's much harder to manage risk. If you buy now, where do you stop yourself out and say you're wrong? It's, it's much harder. I actually you know, I've always been a counter trend player in the market. It's much easier for me to buy something cheap and put a sell stop in. If you buy something now, where are you proven wrong to have bought it? Well, it's going to be way down before there's enough technical proof that having bought was the wrong thing. Now, using what I call equal legs. So if I take the low this year and I took the reaction high where wave one was completed and down to wave two. So if I measured that up move and then take that same up move off of the September low, it measures to 20, uh, just about 206. So on percentage terms, that's still a fair amount that you could have on the upside uh, before running out of steam. And so this 13 is more of a caution flag. It's not a sell signal to me. It's more like, gee, if I'm gonna buy IWM or small cap names now, there's much more implied risk and, and a more difficult task in figuring out what to do. Let's take a look at the VIX. And to me, what's most important about the VIX right now is about a month ago, we got both aggressive and standard sequential downside exhaustion signals to the VIX right around 20. This is a weekly chart. Look back in time, virtually any time we see a downside 13, it doesn't mean you get a big move up or you get a big move up quickly, but you rarely went lower than where those 13s came in. So to me, it also says that uh, we certainly could see a spike in volatility going forward. If I uh, go to a daily chart, notice that over the last two weeks, uh, the TDST line basically held here and we've moved higher. So still short term, I've got weekly 13s. I'm already on a plus five heading up. Makes me think that we can still go slightly higher uh, in VIX terms. And then the last one is Bitcoin. This is not something I generally look at. Um, but what I did want to point out to you is that obviously we're near all-time highs and this is Bitcoin futures, right? So the moment futures started trading back in 2018, Bitcoin fell apart because people were able to hedge and right away. Uh, Goldman Sachs and, and other big Wall Street firms just were selling uh, big amounts of Bitcoin. You can see the 13 on the bottom, 13 on a high here. This 13 was early, but now we have something called a 9139 count. Um, so that makes me hesitant plus, and this is the most important thing I notice, the, the last $7,000 move up from 13,000 to the 20,000 that we saw, open interest has not moved up at all. That means shorts were covering to prior longs who were selling out. That is not what a good bull market typically looks like. So that's why um, I'm, you know, me, I'm not touching this stuff. I don't play cryptos in the first place, but um, I'm certainly not buying up here or recommending anybody does. That's my personal take. Maybe it goes to 50,000 like some people think. I have no idea in my book. This is not what a bull market looks like. That is it for this week. My name is Rick Bensinger. By the way, we are off for the next couple of weeks. So have a great holiday and we will be back in early January. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.